Hey everyone, welcome to Bulletproof Radio. I'm Dave Asprey, but you probably already knew that if you listen all the time. Today's interview is remarkable because if you're watching on YouTube, well, you might know that we're doing this in a place where I don't normally do it because there's no espresso machine and biohacking gear behind me. That's because we're at Brendan Burchard's studio. And today's guest is none other than Brendan. Hey man, thanks for having me. Brendan, I open every show with a cool fact of the day, and I would be remiss if I didn't do that today. So I'm gonna to share today's cool fact of the day with you and with everyone listening. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you wanna get your way and you're a woman, there's actually a study that shows that if you wear high heels, you have a greater chance of getting your way from men. Yes. And like, it's a statistical thing. And men offer that study. I, I believe they did. It was actually sponsored by one of those expensive shoe brands that I couldn't name. But, it, but here's the weird thing. They haven't actually figured out if it's high heels themselves mm. or whether it's the way they change the way you walk. So it could be a change in gait, mm. but there's definitely something in like a double blind study yeah. where you can actually say, hmm, wearing high heels does make the guy say yes for reasons we don't entirely understand. Right. So for women biohackers, I suppose you could say that uh, wearing heels to that meeting, there actually is a reason to do it and it's not just because you like to have your back hurt at the yeah. end of the day. Well, and if you did like a self-study or a self-report psychological study on it and said, what is your emotion as you're putting on your favorite pair of high heels, I promise you they would say, I feel more confident. And so that confidence also probably shows itself out in the world and then they've shown in all negotiation studies, like which are pretty yeah. much inarguable now, the more confident negotiator t typically wins. Mm -hmm. And so you just have the situation, they, they get their way because they're in an emotional, energetic level that's different and maybe the shoe had something to do with it or not. Maybe they could generate that energy anyway, but more confidence usually wins. So, so I, I decided to do my own study on this and I, <laughs> I, I wore high heels to my last negotiation and it totally didn't work. So I, I don't know about the science. Of I'm that. wearing them now for good luck. So. <laughs> <laughs> It, if you don't know who Brendan is, you're, uh, that's okay, you might not know, but you should. Because Brendan is an incredibly well-known uh, author and uh, what, what do you like to be called in, in terms of like, like personal motivation? Like, I, I had a really hard time figuring out what to say because yeah. you've helped like hundreds of thousands of people upgrade different aspects of their life. But, yeah. but I, I'm a writer and a trainer. Okay. And writer first, trainer second. And yeah. I usually write or train on the topics of motivation and personal development or marketing and business. And outside of those two things, I don't write or talk about or know anything. <laughs> so. <laughs> so there's, in, in the Bulletproof life that I, I've led, I've learned things from hundreds and hundreds of people and that's how you go about becoming an expert, yeah. right? And you're one of the guys who's, I'm like, damn, like I have some stuff I can learn here from both sides of what you do. Thank you. But if you don't know, like, let's see, Larry King says you're one of the top motivation and marketing trainers in the world. You've hit number one on the New York Times list. We're actually on at the same time. Uh, this is with uh, your Motivation Manifesto book. Um, let's see, number one personal development show on YouTube, uh, top 100 most followed public figures on Facebook, and you've been on stage with Richard Branson, uh, the Dalai Lama, Katie Couric, Steve Forbes, like, in other words, like, like you're, you're like in a level all of, all of your own. Like, like, like you and Tony Robbins arm wrestle, and which one wins? <laughs> uh, he wins every single time. He's louder than me too, so I mean, he's, <laughs> he's got pretty much every factor of studliness above me, I would say, yeah. <laughs> um, but but you guys kind of run in the same circles, and so it, yeah, we're it, friends and he, he, yeah, deep friends and, and uh, big admirers of each other. So I've been on his stage, he's even on my stage, so we really appreciate each other's work. So, so if uh, if you don't know who Brendan is, that's probably a good introduction. But basically, like like um, you're someone that that I've learned from very specifically, and your your newest book. Um, the one that, that was ahead of me on the New York Times list. Well done again. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, tell me about it. Uh, it's called The Motivation Manifesto, Nine Declarations to Claim Your Personal Power. And it's a book that it's my life's work. It's like if you ever have a book that's your opus and you're so proud of it because you poured everything you had into it, every amount of research, your whole life experience, everything, that was this book for me. And it's a book that's about personal freedom. I make the argument in the book that the main motivation of mankind 
is seeking personal freedom, which I define as that ability to fully express who we truly are and pursue the things that are meaningful and important to us, pursue our dreams. And we want to be free to do those things. We want to be free to be who we are. We want to be free to go after what we want. But we have these two enemies that get in our way every single time. And one is self-oppression. We put ourselves down. So we struggle with doubt and delay and divisiveness from other people. And then there's social oppression, which is the reality that there's critics and people who judge us and people who aren't always nice and kind and supportive of who we are or what we want. And life is about dealing with those two things, dealing with the ways we keep ourselves down and oppress ourselves, dealing with the critics and social oppressions, some social oppression, you know, political tyranny, but sometimes it's also like office politics. Yeah. And so how do you deal with those two things? And this is a book about that. Let's learn to find our own freedom by overcoming our stuff, overcoming the challenge with other people. And I just give nine ways to do that in the book. So the closest book that I could kind of compare this with is, is maybe Think and Grow Rich, mm. where like you're, you're really laying it out there. And, and the style of your book is, is very much uh, like traditional, like, like, like set of declarations. Yeah. It, it doesn't read like kind of a soft new agey thing. <laughs> no. to, tell me the story of how you managed to get a book out that was like classically strong versus sort of popularist. Yeah, like, you, you go to write something called a manifesto. <laughs> you know you have to be a good writer. Yeah. And, and I wasn't, honestly. I, I, like, this book, when you read it, uh, I had readers, you know, millions of readers say this is so much better than anything written before because I spent two years studying how to write this book. So I did a two-year deep study in revolutionist rhetoric. Wow. To try to figure out how did the great leaders of our time, like revolutionist leaders, like the founding fathers of our country or revolutionists or founding um, members of other countries, how did they talk about the desire to pursue personal freedom? Now they were talking about it, political freedom, but how did they do it? Because it's a trick, right? Yeah. How did, how did, if you think about it, how did the founding fathers say to an entire 13 colonies at the time, which were just under around 3 million people at the time, you know, you're enslaved by Britain and we need to change that. And so how do you tell someone that they're trapped and they're caged at the same time tell them they're powerful enough to change it? It's a trick. You have to learn how to do that. And so, and I didn't know how. And so I had to really study the language. And so this book, the reason I think it won all the, the, the accolades it's gotten from real writers so far yeah. is because it opens up rewriting the Declaration of Independence. And we call it the Declaration of Personal Power. Yeah. But it's, it's a true, I keep to form of the format, the structure, the, the pentameter of great writing like that. Because no one writes like that anymore. But I brought it a little modern edge and yep. put a little bit of just, you know, ferocity into it. Because I think people right now, are, are, they're restless. They're, there's a lot of frustration and stress out there that's aimed internally, but also to the world. And they're like, they, there's like, you can feel the stirring of people wanting to revolt or change or at least significantly transform their lives. And I want to tap that energy and put it in chapter one. So we overlaid the Declaration of Independence. And that's why the book feels so momentous. So I did not know that you that you were, had done the Declaration of Independence thing, but it, come to think of it, it does feel like that. Like like this is the way it is, but it, I would say it's more like personal independence yes. in terms of it. That's why I call it personal freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And and for people listening on on the show today, uh, you guys know that that the art of biohacking is like changing the environment around you or inside you, so that you have control of what happens in, in your body and and thus in your life. And there's a set of things, you know, you're taking your vitamins or getting enough sleep. And you and I have like had some offline discussions, yeah. like comparing our vitamin baggies and stuff. <laughs> so like I, I know that you take care of your hardware with the same degree of precision that, that I take care of mine. Yeah. Um, and so let's assume that if you're listening, like, that you're, you're doing some things there and there's probably more you can do there. But all right, so now your hardware's working. But then there's like the software thing, and mm. that's actually more work mm -hmm. than getting, because anyone can like take some pills and exercise and, and eat the right foods and like do the things that are gonna make you know, your cells do their thing. Right. And for some people it's more work than others. But all right, then you're there, and now you're faced with the next big thing, which is, is self-doubt. Mm. So in the book, or just in your experience, like what is someone who's, all right, I've got enough energy now, I've got enough health, and I want to do something that I haven't done before. Yeah. And then there's a process that happens in their mind. And you write about this in your book, but 
walk me through that. Yeah. What what happens with self doubt, and then what's the counter move to that so you can upgrade the software as well as the hardware? Yeah, well, I, lo I love all you said, especially, and I think of when I think of biohacking and everything that you teach and everything that you do, try to do that if you don't have sustained motivation. Like just try, <laughs> Tr try to stay on a diet plan, try yeah. to try to have a great career, try to lead your team, try to do something significant. And I, I think unfortunately right now when, when you talk about software, people sometimes go, oh, motivation, and they kind of poo-poo the topic. Oh. And it's like, no, that's the one thing. I mean, it's easy. I mean, because Chris Farley made fun of motivation, right? So we all learned to laugh <laughs> right, a little bit right. about the guy. Mm -hmm. But you know, but at the same time, without it, that's the problem. Most people say, well, it is self doubt or it is fear that wrecks people's lives. So I open up one of the conversations in the book of of saying it's usually not fear. We conveniently, as a culture, blame fear. Actually, if you go back and you read philosophers of time, you, you don't see as much conversation. Oh, it's always fear, and they're always blaming fear. They're usually blaming self-reliance and personal responsibility and habit and discipline. It's um, only a modern era thing that it's all we all conveniently say fear is the number one thing. And by the way, I, fear is a big dog, and we take that on in the book, and we'll talk about that in relation to self-doubt. But the real problem most people have is sustained motivation. I, I would totally agree with sustained motivation. If you yeah. have sustained motivation, you'll overcome the fear. Yeah, that's the salt. Because you, you keep trying. Yeah. But, but if you're just, you know, I, I, I don't have any more, um, any more ability to bring it. Yeah. Uh, then, all right, I, you give up. Yeah. So, so you're saying it's the lack of motivation, or I would interpret that as lack of energy, because energy powers motivation. Right, right. And so then you, you hit the wall, and you're like, I'm, I'm done. I'm yeah. not, not going to face that. Whether it was facing a fear or a challenge, it's right. semantics, right? Totally. And I think in terms of the self doubt and like, what do we do with it? Because I like to give tactical things for people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, a lot of people have a lot of self-doubt because they lack clarity and competence. Yep. Right? And so they don't have the confidence. In psychology, we often talk about the competence-confidence loop. Mm -hmm. Right? The more you kind of understand something and master it, the more you have confidence in it. The more you have confidence in it, the more you push the edge, where you'll discover and learn more. And so you have this great infinity between the two, the more competence and usually confidence. But that first piece of clarity is where people really struggle with self-doubt. So they say, why don't, you know, it's not that they hate themselves, they just often don't know themselves, okay. or they're not being intentional during the day. One of my favorite activities, simple takeaway, I was teaching at our last High Performance Academy, we had Ariana Huffington, she came backstage, mm -hmm. she's like, what are like some tactical things you do? I said, let me show you my favorite thing of all time. So give me your phone, I said, pull up her phone. I said, let's put three words in here as an alarm that go off three times, they go off throughout the day, this set of three words that remind you of your highest, best self. Wow. So I tell people, just find, what are three words that would describe your highest, best self? Even if you're not there now, they could be aspirational, so, right? So if next time I see Ariana, like, I'm gonna ask her what her three words <laughs> yeah, are. Yeah, exactly. And she's gonna tell me? I would love that if All she right, did. I'm gonna ask her, did. all right. <laughs> well, because here's what it, what it does is, and I, I've done this for years, you can, just like you biohack your life with some technology and tools, you can biohack your mind. A simple reminder going off three times a day of who you are mm -hmm. and stating the aspirational can help you overcome self-doubt because a lot of self-doubt is just you haven't connected with who you are. You, and you haven't done the time, you haven't spent the time. You just mm -hmm. haven't said, what do I want to be about today? And driven your life intentionally that day. And with more intention throughout the day to be who we want to be through our beliefs and our behaviors we start to find more confidence in self. It, it seems not that easy to, quote, find out who you are. Right. I mean, that, that sounds kind of new agey, and yeah. that's not a criticism, but yeah. so, all right, you're a hardcore scientist. You know, you're, you're listening to this going, well, how could I not know who I am? Like, like that's too <laughs> abstract, yeah. right? And uh, to be honest, my background, engineering and computer science and, and all that stuff, um, there was a time in my life when I've been like, you know, for God's sake, what do you mean? Like, you know, but like, like it's obvious, and I, I was also kind of an angry guy, and <laughs> yeah. like I, I didn't, I, I wasn't self-aware enough yeah. to really recognize my core essence there. Hmm. But how does someone who either doesn't connect with that that phrase at all, or someone who's just getting going in, in life and in their career, uh, you know, early twenties, your prefrontal cortex is almost done for me. Yeah. Um, how do you find out who you are in order to then I tell people do that? Don't find it. Don't okay. try to find it. It's like mm -hmm. I. You don't find your purpose in life either. You walk out the door one day and you know, 
the piano of purpose falls on your head and you're like, oh, I found it. I found it. It just the, hit me in the head. It the, doesn't the work like that. The piano of purpose? No, I said, d don't find out who you are. Decide yeah. who you are. Okay, so, so and you, if this, you, you have control of that and you decide, all right. You, yeah, and that's mm -hmm. what these three words and this activity of just, it's so simple, but as you know, if you're not intentional about your food each day, you're gonna end up fat, slovenly, and just destroyed. It's true. Because that's what the society will just push you to convenience and ease and speed, and you'll take it, and you'll consume too much. Yeah, fast food The same food thing the happens time. intellectually and psychologically for us, right? The world says, no, just go, you know, go with the flow, just be easy, you know? And so a lot of people just show up in environments and they have no presence or intention at all. And the less presence and the less intention you have, the more self-doubt. But once you have presence and intention, and it's something you choose to have, let me give you an example. If this sounds too esoteric for people, because sometimes, they say, yeah, yeah, what is kid Brendan talking about, you know? Um, the Dalai Lama, his intention, and I've, I've been blessed to meet him twice, and his intention is so obvious. It's so obvious. Yeah. His intention is kindness and compassion and happiness. Those are his three words. I got to ask. Nice. He's going to make those happen in the environment he's in. That is why he is such an unbelievably kind, compassionate, and happy guy. Because he decided he was going to be that and stand for that. Not just for himself, for other people. I think another level of self-doubt is like knocked away when we decide to serve. Yes. When we say, like you've done, I'm going to be a role model for people. Now, when I say that, or someone listening, because I'm like, well, that's an egoic thing to say. Yeah. No. It might be one of the most profound things you ever give yourself the gift of, is to say, what would it be required of me to be my best self? What would my best self look like, feel like, sense like? And then to demonstrate that to the world, not only is that just an absolute exemplary like personification of personal power, mm -hmm. it is service to other people. The it, world needs yeah. people who aren't so, look, there are so many people wandering around who are completely lost or self-doubt. And I don't make fun of that. My, my whole mission in my life has been to help that. But we've, the first thing has to happen, we've got to get an intention for them to live into their best self. So this ties into things like, like leadership and the idea that someone who's not officially the boss but can still be a leader because they walk in and they exemplify something and like kindness is, is a great one. Right. But th there's, there's strength and, and there's power and motivation and, and all these things. Can I make but, a simple yeah. um, uh, clarity piece that, that will really help a lot of people? is uh, I, I talk a lot about the baseline human drives and what really drives us. And one drive that we all have is congruence. Mm -hmm. We want to be congruent with who we think we are and how we're demonstrating ourselves to the world. So basic, but a lot of people, when we're really struggling with self-doubt, it's because we know that in, there's something inside that's rattling around. We got a little lion in us, but we're living as mice. It, the book opens yeah. up that way to talk about why. Well, you have like, if I'm recalling, there were 10 primary drivers in that book. What yeah. was the title of that one for people who might want to uh, read it? It's called The Charge. The Charge, Act thank activating you. Activating the 10 human drives that make you mm -hmm. feel alive. That's, that's a good book. Uh, I, thank you. I don't know why I'm not sticking the title right now, but um, it, it, to have those 10 things laid out it, is really accurate. And I, I certainly dealt with that because there's a set of things that you're supposed to to do and be, and that comes from advertising, it comes from parenting, right. it comes from religion, <laughs> uh, you know, and it comes from society, honestly, like, you know, know your place. And that, for me, and I think for a lot of people, it creates stress. And, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we do as, as human animals is we wanna do things that, that are not useless stress. So stress that causes you to grow is yes. good stress, yes. but stress that's like, I'm not living, I, I, I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do. I may not know what I'm supposed to do, but I know that whatever, whatever they told me I was supposed to be isn't it. Right. So like, how do I, how do, I do this? And what I hear from, from people, um, especially in you know, the, the first decade of adulthood, is like, like, I know something's mismatched here, but I don't know where to go to get here, right. up, up to this other part where I, I would feel congruent there. So there's like this vague sense of unease, a vague sense of stress, yes. but there isn't a roadmap to say, do this. And my approach there is, well, get your energy up so your motivation can be up. Love that. Uh, and that's kind of some, why Bulletproof Coffee, Bulletproof Diet and all that stuff. It's like, just enter, get the energy up, because then you're like, I'm so supercharged, I'm gonna go find my mission or find what it is and yes. maybe you're gonna make some weird choices that scare the crap out of the people around you. Yeah, that's why I love your work. 
Oh, I mean, thanks. everything we talk about at base in, in our software, like you said earlier, it does rely on a component of health. You know, if you're wiped out, it's hard to feel the charge in life, mm -hmm. you know, internally or externally, just like that sense of energy and enthusiasm and engagement, if your body is wiped out, you know? And, yeah. But the same thing we're, we're talking about here is so interesting because I think about your work now in my own mind. When I read your work, I listen to you, I'm look, listen for those takeaways and those habits I can implement. What that is, is you're giving people personal power. See, a lot of self-doubt comes from what you talked about, that vagueness. Like I genuinely know, I, there's just no clarity and intention there. And so as soon as they have that, everything can start to shift in a new direction for them because now they're focused on it. And part of, uh, we give this framework for motivation and this idea that motivation is sparked from ambition, that you kind of have to have a desire for something more yeah. to, to spark the ambition. Like what is it that you truly desire? You have to be hungry for something and you have to expect that you can go get it. But the second thing is attention and effort. And if you give attention and effort to something, then that sustains and starts kicking up that motivation. And I say all that for just a simple idea. Uh, declaration two in the Motivation Manifesto is this idea of we shall reclaim our agenda. It's taking back control of our day, just like you teach people to take back control of their diet mm -hmm. and their energy. When we start taking back control of our day, getting just again a little bit more control about our day to do good things for ourselves, we start to find the attention and the focus on ourselves grows and yeah. we start to find that we start to enjoy life more. We start to feel a higher level of control which is the first human drive. As we start to master our day a little bit more, we have a little more competence. We're doing what we believe we should be doing. We get more congruence and all of a sudden all these, it's so subtle, but all of a sudden you find a person, if you just get back their day, just like I'm sure you find, if we could just get their breakfast back, yeah. right? If I'm just like, if we could just get the first couple hours back, they'll start to find that they're back in control of their life and the self-doubt starts going away. That's interesting. So the, the manifestation of control can be just even in your calendar. Like, yeah. like one of the things that was, was stressful for me as I got more and more busy with, with Bulletproof, um, I work with a, a team that helps me to manage my time so I'm not sort of wasting it. But my calendar just got stacked, like back to back <laughs> to back. And, and I'm like, you know what? I want a personal upgrade hour in here. Like every day, like nice. I, I might do something. It might be neurofeedback. It might be exercise. I, I might sit in an ice bath, uh, all sorts of crazy stuff. But something at least once a day that, mm -hmm. that makes me stronger or better or at least recharges the batteries. Because I, I found for a good almost nine months there, like I didn't do any of that. It was like come out, come out of you know the biohacking uh, office, run into the house, which is a, a 20 foot commute or something, and then play with two little kids and like be a husband. But I wasn't, I wasn't doing the recharge thing. Mm. So reclaiming your agenda, the way you're talking about it, is is exactly that. Saying well. It, if I don't you know, put a quarter in the savings account, I won't have any money. If I don't put a quarter in the energy account, right. I, I'm not gonna have the ability to bring it and I'm not gonna achieve the bigger things that, that I have in, in yeah. mind. And so many people are racked with uh, guilt about mm -hmm. their day's agenda. You talk about yeah. a day, I don't just mean their daily schedule, I mean their life agenda. Yeah. Where are you going? Because I, I tell people, that, where are you going? They say, well, I don't know. I say, let's look for evidence of where you're gonna end up. <laughs> you're going somewhere, Ouch. it's clear. Right? Just, yeah. I mean, you gotta do that in health too. Yeah. It's like, look, uh, the, the, what you're experiencing right now in life is in some ways a result mm -hmm. of some good luck, some bad luck, some of your actions, some actions of other people. But here we are, and so your life agenda, where are you gonna be in 10 years? Probably in the same exact spot, unless you take back control. Mm -hmm. And as soon as people start taking just little bits of control, whether it's their diet, or whether it is what they're gonna do during the day, or what they're gonna say no to, yeah. or how they're gonna to choose to feel throughout the day, because I believe emotions can be felt, but attitudes are generated. And so we have to feel like, wow, you know, the most powerful metaphor I ever had in my own personal health was that the power plant doesn't have energy, it transforms and generates energy. Okay, yeah. Right? You and I don't have happiness. It's not, it's not sitting around somewhere in yeah. my pocket. Uh -huh. You generate it. Yeah. Right? I feel the same about confidence. I feel the same about depression. I feel like we are choosing these things. I don't mean clinical depression, by the way. But we, we generally get to choose the emotional palette of our day. Maybe not by the hour. Something can happen, piss you off. Yeah. You know, get you all fired up when someone cuts you off. But if you carry that in the office, that's just lack of presence and intention. 
Yeah, maybe lack of, of skill. Like, yes. Like there, there were there were times in my life where I would okay exactly someone cuts me off and you're like that you know and you're mad for two or three hours, yeah. and it's not that I chose to be mad. It's that my nervous system, my body was yep. was basically taking charge because I didn't have the skills yes. to tell it to shut the hell up. Yep. And that's why things like meditation, breathing, uh, heart rate variability, whatever the, the technology is, and meditation is a technology just like any other. It yeah. just doesn't have silicon involved, right? right? <laughs> um, but, but those things, if you don't have that, you can actually end up feeling guilty about your emotions. And, yeah. and this, the thing that, that I learned uh, maybe when I was 30 was that Emotions have no rationality to them. Right. right? That's why they're emotions, they not happen. thoughts. They're right? feeling. Right, and they just happen. But then I would get in this weird loop where it's like, well, I can't believe I'm feeling this way. Like, I must be weak because I'm still mad. And I shouldn't be mad. <laughs> so I'm a bad person because I'm mad about that a hole who cut me off, right? Yes. And, and you get in that weird loop, like, this is an inappropriate emotion, and how dare I feel that? Yes. Um, and I, I mean, I had it completely wrong. From the framework of the Motivation Manifesto, how do you deal with that sort of, well, you, you should choose to have a good day, well, but I'm having a bad day. Right. Like, is it because I did it wrong? Like, yep. Oh, what? I love what you said because it's so, and your audience will get this so well. It's skill. Yeah. It's skill. It's, and how do you develop a skill? You choose to focus on this thing, you put a practice in, and you keep doing it. So here's what I tell people, I say, you don't have to quash all of the negative emotions yeah. that you happen to feel. What you have to do is teach yourself to generate the emotions you do want to feel on a consistent enough basis. Good example, Oprah has had a gratitude journal for 30 years of yeah. her life, okay? She chooses to feel gratitude at the end of the day and write about it. By focusing on it and doing it, she became a, a grateful person. And what happens is getting that one little sliver of control over that one emotion gives your mind like, I can control my emotions. Mm -hmm. It sounds so silly. But the more you generate, it's like a big part of motivation manifesto, even though it sounds very masculine, motivation manifesto, yeah. uh, you know, there's declarations on there, of amplify love, practice, joy, and gratitude. And I think one of the most important things we do to people is teach them the emotions they can generate and how profound it can be once you realize you can do it. Once you realize you can create joy, once you realize you can create gratitude, you can create happiness in the moment, but you practice it, Yep. To develop it as a skill, now you have competence, now you feel more congruent, you have more control, and you start getting a little bit more motivation. The, the idea that emotion is a skill. Is the most important it, finding, I think, of human psychology. It, it, absolutely, and, and there's a, a dividing line. In, in fact, I, I tend to fall into the, the Buddhist hindrances list. You know, th mm. things like, like fear, um, aggression, and I'm probably listing all of them wrong, but essentially the negative emotions. Yeah. Right, and those those things where distractibility uh, can fall into that sort of thing. These are the things that take you out of the zone. So, in my own like inner wiring, I'm like, all right, there's the emotions, the negative emotions, um, and those generally coming from my nervous system trying to keep me from dying, from tigers and, and things that make no sense. Um, but if I let, if I identify it as those are me. I'm actually losing the battle. I'm like, no, right. my body is is you know feeling this thing. I'm I'm not interested in that. So how do I then consciously turn on these mm -hmm. other emotions? And the framework that all of us in especially in the West learn is that those emotions are equal. Like these are good, these are bad, but they don't come from the same place. Yeah. And it's hard to make yourself afraid. Right. Like, like if if you don't want to be afraid, you might watch a scary movie or something. But it's hard to generate like real fear and anxiety. But it's actually possible to train yourself to say, I'm going to create relaxation. I'm going to create bliss. I'm going to create mindfulness. And so it turns out those negative emotions are less programmable right. um, than the positive ones. And so you have more control. And the positive ones are like you. And right. the negative ones are like an old operating system remnant that's there to keep you know, keep yeah. you from falling off cliffs and stuff. Yeah. Or to keep you incongruent. Some, some, it's funny, positive and negative is such a loaded thing yeah. too, right? Because people say, well, guilt is such a bad thing. No, well, if you just shot somebody in the face, I'm really glad you feel guilty about that. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like guilt can be a good thing to structure good behavior as well. Uh -huh. Like I tell people, they say, how do you hire people? I go, I hire for guilt. They say, what do you That's mean? That's interesting. I won't hire, I'll add one of my, interview questions, this is called the High Performance Hiring, we have High Performance uh, Academy, which I'll tell you about, mm -hmm. uh, a cool trick to answer your question about how do you get the good stuff conditioned. But one of the questions I'll ask somebody, I'll say, tell me about a time you were involved in a project 
and it just went off the rails. I mean, it com completely went bad and kind of messed things up. As a person tells me about that project, if I can't hear any kind of like, they're bummed out or they were regretful or, or there's a little guilt about it, they're just like, dang it, you know, I wish that, if, if that, I won't hire them. Wow. Because you want somebody who would feel bad if they didn't do a good job. Yeah. That's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I'm, that's, that, that's I'm just doing that as a quick too, right? qualifier. Yeah, yeah. Yes, as a quick qualifier. Um, yes, and what keeps us in integrity is we would feel bad if we did something else. So feeling yeah. bad is not necessarily a negative thing. It's a negative thing when it takes over us yes. and it endures. And so let me t teach you that trick from High Performance Academy. It's called RWID, Relative Weight of Importance and Duration. It's the secret to tell whether or not somebody is healthy psychologically when dealing with negative emotion. Mm -hmm. If we have a negative emotion, and we give that emotion during the day a high relative weight of importance, and we keep holding it, and duration, we keep our focus on it over a period of time, meaning we, we sense it incredibly intensely, but we keep sensing it, we keep focusing on it, we keep paying attention to it, we don't let it go, and now it starts derailing our further beliefs, behaviors, ambitions, goals. That's not healthy. Yep. But knowing that also gives us power too, because we can choose to have an emotion, to create the thoughts in our mind to have an emotion, uh, even like confidence. And we can say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna choose to feel confident. How would I stand, move, talk, breathe, project, if I was a little more confident, just not Mr. Confident, just yeah, a yeah. little more. What, what would that be like? What would that feel like? And we decided to try that a couple times and we made confidence something, you know, that needs to be important to me. And I'm gonna focus on that over a period of time. Every single day, I'm gonna find the, my marks where I'm gonna be a little more confident than I usually would. Just try. Trying that over a period of time develops the skill. And I think what happens for people who are also miserable, who endure suffering, and we know this from Buddhism as well, I know you studied as much as I have, is this idea that a lot of suffering comes from attachment. Yeah. That's RWID. The, the weight and the attachment, the endurance, the duration of the focus on that thing becomes the attachment which becomes negative. Yeah, so it, it, you feel it and you let it go, that's a win. You yeah. feel it and you, you identify with it, you become it and you let it ruin your day, that's not a win. Right, right, right. So, so I missed High Performance Academy this year because, uh, and I'm actually gonna blame uh, you, Joe Polish, if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> Joe Polish is usually the root of yeah. almost every problem that we know. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I tell you, yeah, he, 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 an amazing guy, but I had a prior <laughs> commitment with Joe, which is why I didn't make it. So next year I'll, I'll be attending your High Performance Academy event because it's, uh, uh, I have a great number of friends who've gone and, and have nothing but wonderful things to say. So I look forward to learning the rest of the tricks uh, from that. Yeah, because um, that's a psychological yeah, hack, isn't it? Yeah. Just like is what you're gonna, uh, in, when you realize that the control factors are the weight of importance and duration, now you start playing with them, right? Yeah. You start doing your tests with them. You start figuring it out. But Because I think the most important thing that people can really do in their lives is say, I'm going to learn to understand and master my emotions. Yeah because those are usually things that derail people and they don't know why. But they also, I make the argument, you don't always have to know why. You know, if you wake up in the morning and you just you feel like crap and you don't know what's going on exactly and you're just not highly ambitious during the day, you could do a root, out, root cause analysis, which for a lot of people causes paralysis or guilt or shame yeah, or yeah. awful. Or you can just say, okay, what's the plan? Let me just set three small goals today and moving forward. I mean, when you're dealing with someone who's really struggling emotionally with their life, sometimes just making search, say, you know what? I'm gonna give you three goals today. Just have three goals. I mean, it could be as simple as take a shower today. Yep. For real. I mean, I'm not even saying that, I'm not smiling when I say this. Like, that could be a win for somebody that day. If they're really, really down, yeah. Call somebody mm -hmm. to move something forward, to ask for help. That can be a win. You know, uh, send out, write that letter you've been writing to write. Just, it can be simple things that start giving us those pieces of control and efficacy and uh, a sense of power back in our lives. They can be so simple. And I think you found that too. Sometimes you just gotta do the simple things first. It develops a little bit more competence and skill. And now you're willing to push a little bit harder yep. and go a little further. The, the understanding why thing is fascinating because you can talk with, uh, like, like Dan Sullivan will, will tell you, you know, that there isn't a reason why. Like, I want something, I, I just want it. Like, 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 there isn't a rational thing. There's, uh, for these emotions, there's sometimes a why, but it's an irrational why, right? And it comes from very old nervous system programming. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like, you know, someone almost dropped me when I was, you know, two years old. Right. And now I have a fear of falling, right? 
you're not going to know the why. You're probably never going to know that unless you're doing some weird psychology thing, right? <laughs> um, but the fact that, okay, I, I know there's this association here, but you can still cure or prevent or reprogram that fear of falling if it's getting in the way of your life without necessarily connecting the dots to the why. That's right. And so, and it's really important for people to hear that. And, and I'll, I'll say this next thing with prefacing, I'm not a psychologist. Um, you know, you, you've I, read a thing or two though. Yeah, I've read a thing. I'm not, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychoanalyst, I'm not a neuroscientist, you know, nothing that ends with ist mm -hmm. that I know about. But here's what I do know. All effort of therapy, and uh, all effort of therapy, even if it goes back, even if there's regression, even if there's conversation, even if there's hypnosis, yep. any effort to explore the past always results the same in all therapies. It is coming back today with the client to make a decision today about what they're going to be about and what are the healthy beliefs and behaviors they can now institute in their life to grow and go. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you know, we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of psychologists at High Performance Academy. And I always ask, is that, is that true? Is it the whole focus? Let's get them back today making healthy decisions and choices for themselves. That's the focus. So sometimes we can just make those decisions and just start implementing them and catch up to ourselves and start feeling better yeah. about ourselves and then explore you know, our own self-awareness in greater depths from a place of confidence and success versus a place of just being debilitated. So, so let's say someone listening, and there's a lot of Bulletproof listeners, um, you're listening to this now, who are pretty successful already, yeah. like, like they're feeling pretty good. But I, I get these phone calls and, and emails from people and they're like, you know, I, I've had a great career, um, but I, I, they're not feeling congruence, the thing we talked about a little yeah. bit earlier, right? And a lot of people, especially, you know, I'm, I'm slightly over 40, just turned 42, and guys 10 years older than me, like, like you tell them, you should like see a psychologist, and they're like, like I'm not a wuss. Like, 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 the, like there's, <laughs> no. it's not, it's not manly. Oh, really? Right, yeah. right. Like, it, it's not acceptable. It's an admission of weakness yeah. to do that. So, what's your answer to people who are like, well, there's nothing wrong with me. Like, like I, I'm not going to admit that that a desire for improvement is something wrong with me, or I'm not going to yeah. see it that way. Have well, you? first, I don't agree. I think, I think the best, if you've been struggling with any emotion, or you've been struggling with momentum in your life for a period of years and years and years. That is proof evidence you need to talk to somebody and ask for help. <laughs> it just it's true. Yeah. If, it's been, if it's gone on, mm -hmm. you can't handle on yourself and don't fool yourself. You can. You need to get some help. I'm, I'm a huge proponent of therapy. I think everybody okay. should do it. It's fascinating. Marcus Aurelius said, you know, one of the most powerful things a man can do is explore his own emotions and learn to understand them with the help of someone else. Like, yeah. this is powerful stuff, right? Um, this is the guy who I think is one of the most manliest men of all time, maybe. So I, I think that's pretty powerful. I think the other part about it is, and this will be hard, but I do this with a lot of CEOs we work with. It's not comforting for them when I say this. I say, do you feel like other people understand you? Mm -hmm. And most people, yeah, yeah. I said, no, really. Do you think your team really understands how hard you work? And they'll go. I mean, do people really know the responsibilities on your shoulder? I'll start asking them. Yeah. And sure enough, they start to say, no. And over a period of time, what I always find, especially at high performers, I mean, the top level guys, I mean, Fortune 50 guys I coach, right, who are like just up there. Here's what often they, they get in a place psychologically in their life at some point where they go, they don't understand me. They don't understand me. And that is the most dangerous place to be in the world. Sounds like a 16 year old. Right? Exactly. <laughs> and here's what ends up happening. Here's where that's actually, it's, what, the trick is, that it's, what, it, the amazing thing is, the actual, I think my perspective on it anyway, is that when someone says they don't understand me, that's called the caged life. You, you take a, a wild, ferocious, free, powerful animal, throw them in a zoo, put them in the cage, watch what happens. They're ferocious, they're mean, they're activated, they're aggressive for a period of time, and then they end up becoming resigned. They go mm. to the back of the cage, they kind of huddle down, they look at everybody walking by, and they just there's this look of aggression, but there's resignation there. They've just sat back, they've given up, they're frustrated, they're, you know, they're there. This happens for a lot of executives. And they get more and more successful, more and more responsibility, bigger and bigger team, more and more money, and they start to say, people don't understand how hard it is for me. Oh, look at them judging me because of my money, fame, wealth, influence, power. And they just start becoming resigned. Wow. They become frustrated. And from a place of resignation, there's oh, that gorilla in the cage has no motivation. It won't eat. Wow. And so when a powerful man has lost, or a powerful executive, doesn't matter, I'm yeah. using the, the we, we were Human, talking about a man yeah. earlier, but a powerful person 
is in a place in which they don't feel a lot of motivation, it's because they became resigned and they started saying, they don't understand me. And guess what that is? Ego. Yeah, there you go. In, in the Motivation Manifesto, we talk about one of the, our internal demons is called division. That I feel separate from others. Mm -hmm. That's ego. And it says, I am separate, better than, holier than thou, or less than. That's yeah. all ego. And so here's the number one problem with that. It's, for someone to say, they don't understand me, that's not a wimpy thing to do. That's actually the highest level of ego you can have. And the number one tragic thing happens with that person. Those are the very people who never ask for help. <laughs> if you believe that people don't understand you, mm -hmm. why would you ask them for help? And that is why people don't get into therapy. They don't, get into, they don't do self-awareness. They don't come to my you know, type of programs or personal development programs. They don't seek counseling. They don't do that because at some point they got fooled. Their resignation and frustration with other people it's really an egoic thing that says, well, people wouldn't understand me anyway. So now they don't ask for help and they don't progress and they lack motivation. So back in maybe 2000, I had a chance to spend some time with uh, David Patrick, the CEO mm. of Charles Schwab at the time. Mm. And he, he was talking about you know, emotional awareness. And you go back a decade, not a lot of CEOs would, would, <laughs> would say that. So I, like, he had balls for saying that. Cool. And I asked him in front of like 100 people, I'm like, so like, do you see a therapist? Like, like, what's the deal? Because you're talking about all this stuff. And, and honestly, I have no idea what, what you're talking about. And, and I mean, what is that? He's like, yeah. He, he goes, of course I see a therapist. And the mindset that I got from that, it, and one that, that I've been fortunate to share with, with a few other people is like, most of us don't fix our own cars. I, I mean, maybe you did when you were in high school. I, I did, mm. but like, you don't do it because there's an expert in that, and you know, you don't you don't do a lot of things without a coach who studied this, right. who teaches you how to do it. But then we have this kind of DIY, you know, Home Depot mentality for gaining awareness of the most slippery part yes. of you, because your emotions don't want you to understand them, because they think they're there to keep you alive. Yeah. Um, for me, a lot of, of my learning has come from having like a lie detector on, on my head. You talk about ego, <laughs> like your ego will hide from you. Yeah. But when there's a lie detector and I'm lying to myself because of my ego, like, I, like you I mean, see I, this scratch and you, oh, it, it's like it makes you nauseous. Yeah. Like, like it makes you cry yeah. because you're like, I can't believe I was doing that to myself. And you're like, that was my ego doing it to me, like that 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 bastard. Yeah. But um, it, it's scary stuff. But without an expert to act as a mirror? Yes, even that, that, that person, yeah. you know, and this doesn't have to be a thing of, 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 of us just saying everyone needs to get a therapist or, or go see a psychologist. If anything, I say to people that say, well, get a life coach, a high yeah. performance coach. Get a great friend who you can yeah. dialogue about your, 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 your potentials. I mean, there's a reason that some of the most successful people in history had friends, they would get together for lunch, and dinner on a continual basis for years and years and years, like a Warren Buffett. They yeah. would just they get together with the same people and they talk through what's going on in their life. It is through the dialogue of what we're experiencing in our life that we often find our true self-expressions. And so mm. now, in doing that and talking it through with a friend, it can be anyone. I just tell everybody, your number one thing in terms of competence building should be a lifelong pursuit of study, of psychology and personal performance. And so my, you know, I've read a book a week for 19 years in psychology or personal development or spirituality. I never missed even, the, you know, those times I was in the hospital, which you know about. Yeah. That, that is what is, it enabled me to experience the life that I want. I don't just mean I, I became externally successful, which I was blessed to do. I mean, I have an unbelievably flourishing emotional quality of life. I love my life. Yeah, I, I, shows, I'm happy, yeah. I'm, I'm energized. I, I can pick the emotional palette that I want to play from. If something gets me down, it, 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 it affects me in that way, it's an hour or less and I'm gone, I'm moved on and I feel great. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a skill and I would hope that everyone wants to get that. And I would say the number one skill, whether you learned it from me or somebody else, master your motivation. Master what is your ambition, what's your attention, what is the uh, awareness that you have about where you're moving. Because at some point in our lives, we realize we're, we're either, the book talks about, we either become a straggler or a striver. Mm -hmm. and they're two different people. Like, I, I have this visual metaphor of the striver being the, the, the person who has sort of a, a lance uh, of intention. Mm -hmm. And they, they throw that lance out into the field of the distant future. And they make it their effort to go get that each day. Pick it yeah. up, throw it forward. 
Mm -hmm. there's other people who just kind of wander around and they're usually marching under the canopy of somebody else's ambitions, somebody else's rules, mm -hmm. somebody else's bureaucracy, somebody else's life. They're living their parents' life, their professor's life, their peers' lives. They're marching under somebody else's banner because they never just said, what is it I desire? And really sat and did the work, threw it out, and then just took daily efforts to go get it. Yep. And it is those daily efforts that we start finding personal power. Again, they can be small at first, but then you're marching, and then you're striving, and then you're running, and then you find that balance and you find more power. The, you said something really important there. It, it, it's the little steps. And I, I've found going to something as simple as, as diet, like perfection, you know, where the lance is going to end after you've thrown it 10 times, maybe that's the goal. But it, if you're going to feel guilty because you didn't throw it the first time you hit it there, it, it doesn't work because guilt sabotages. Yeah. So the idea is, is it was, you were successful if you had two choices and you made the better of the two, even if neither of them was perfect. Right. And, and you can do that for anything that isn't diet related. But the idea is, is make a slightly better choice and you're moving the needle. Yes. And, and, and when people don't do that because of fear of perfection, I love, but I don't know if you heard my riff on perfection before. Share it. I have a, a YouTube video. I think it's like almost a million views on this uh, we'll, topic. We'll link to that in the show notes. Uh, no, it's just funny because uh, I like to say uh, perfection is the grand lie. Nice. Right? And, and here's why. Because perfectionists, they're actually liars. They say, well, I'm a perfectionist. If they say that and they don't ever begin, what's really happening is if, if they were actually, a perfectionist would actually be accurate, wouldn't they? By definition? <laughs> a perfectionist, if accurate, would say, well, what's happening for me right now is I am uncertain or I am scared. I don't mm -hmm. know what to do or I'm fearful of doing it. That yeah. would be accurate. I, I'm a procrastinator, which is the same as a perfectionist. Yes. But yeah. and, well, and the great thing about procrastinators yeah. too, it's the same exact thing. And the perfectionist and the procrastinator, here's the, the sort of the ugly truth of it. Perfection by definition cannot happen for something until it's released. Something becomes perfected. It cannot be perfected until it's done first once. Mm-hmm. So someone says, well, I, you know, don't understand, Brennan, I haven't, I haven't started this dream because I'm a perfectionist, I wanna get it right. I said, no, actually, if you were a perfectionist, you would have begun it and kept tweaking at it. Yeah. Perfectionism requires optimization. You can't optimize it unless you first do it. Yeah. It's like, you, unless you have the prototype, you can't perfect it. So anyone who's a perfectionist and has stalled or stopped, they're actually not a perfectionist, they're just scared or uncertain. It, also, perfection is asymptotic. Like I, yeah. I always joke I about that, beef. Yeah. I, I did this uh, with uh, the waitress last night. I'm like, oh, was this beef grass fed? And, and I say this about the, if you're a waitress right now, it wasn't crowded and we were just having fun conversation. <laughs> I, I, He's I, a respectful, I, kind yeah, man. I, I wasn't being like a total jerk. <laughs> oh, I, I was actually flirting a little bit. So I, I'm, I'm like, so, so is this beef grass fed? And this is Portland. So like, what? how dare you even think our beef is not grass fed? I'm like, was it grass finished? Yeah. And, and she said, you know, and actually it was, you know, raised on a local ranch and, and gave me more details. And I'm like, was it massaged by monks? <laughs> and, and, and she goes, yes. And, and I said, were they left-handed? And, and, and she goes, you know, like, like okay, fine. And she says, actually, they were, because left hand is more rare. I said, that was the right answer. I'll, I'll take two, you know. But but it's that sort of thing. <laughs> like, like, you can always find a way to make it more perfect. Like, was it raised in zero gravity? It, it doesn't right, really right. matter, but, <laughs> but you'll never reach perfection. You can always take a step closer. And eventually, the steps become so expensive with so little return yes. that it's close enough to perfect. But to acknowledge that there's always something more you could do, yeah. but you are going to consciously not do it because it doesn't matter anymore. You love it. For me, that's liberating because I, I find beauty and elegance in identifying that final point, like in math, like, like okay, what is, the, the, what is infinity? Well, it's infinite, but it's there. Yeah. And you can come closer and closer and closer to infinity, but you can always add one more. And, and just recognize that I'm not gonna add one more today. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm where I wanna be, I'm within a standard deviation of perfection, or two or three or 10, whatever. Then I'm free, and I've, I've gained what I wanted to gain from that. And I can go on and I can find something else that I don't want to perfect, but I want to move. Right. Right. Start with good. Yeah. You know, start with good. Yeah. I mean, we're all, I think we're all struggling with the same questions. And I, I certainly, in my industry, you know, we have the number one self help show on the web now, uh, 18 million views this last year. And by the way, but just drop, drop that URL because I don't think a lot of my listeners know about your show. Oh, it's just uh, they go to YouTube and type in Brendan Burchard. Uh, there it's you called go. The Charged Life mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube. And, uh, but I stand on the shoulders of just awesome people. I mean, I've studied everybody in this industry and to, to sort of put a button on what you just said is, uh, you know, the great Zig Ziglar said, you don't have to be 
great to begin, yeah. but you have to begin to become great. Yeah, you, profound you gotta, words. It's so profound. You just got to get in the game. And even for those who are already high performers, because I know that's your audience, it's like, okay, what's the next level of action for you? What's the next level of habit and routine for you? What's the next level of ambition for you? Because everybody's got those. Everyone can optimize a little bit, but what mm -hmm. happens is sometimes we get really comfortable. Because I talk about three kinds of life. There's the cage life, which I talked about. The comfortable life is everything's going pretty good. Yep. And you know, you've got the picket house, the white fence, uh, the white picket fence house, whatever they call it. You got the car, you're keeping up with everybody, your income's higher than you imagine. The groceries are stocked with the good stuff. There's lots of greens, lots of healthy things, lots of healthy meats. Uh, you've got supplementation, you've got unbelievable coffee. I mean, yeah. everything <laughs> is great. And then one day you wake up race, restless and someone says, how's your day going, man? And you find yourself saying, it's fine. Fine is the calling card of mediocrity. It means what happened for you is, because you only say it's fine because you know that it could be extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And that you, everyone knows there's this next place, what I, I call it the charge life, right? Mm -hmm. there's, you, you got the cage, you got comfortable, you've got charge. There, there's something more here. Yeah. Find out what that is. It, it usually has an element of there, there's greater energy in your mind and your body when you think about it. There's greater engagement with it. You've, you've been, you'd love to study it or look at it or talk with people about it. Mm -hmm. And there's a higher level of enthusiasm. You're like, yeah. I, I, I can't wait to experience that, to do that, to see that. So start looking for those things, especially if you're watching, you're a high performer and you got comfortable. You know, it. as soon as I said it, you got it. You're like, dang it, I'm comfortable. Because as soon as you get there, it's not that you can't find you know, uh, peace and joy and happiness in where you're at, but that itch, that is something that should be explored. When you find that, that joy, it's not about a lot of people who are in comfortable, high-performing lives, they got all the reasons in the world to be happy and successful, and they should feel that way. And they should also be bold and brave enough to say, what's the next level of action for me? The next habit, the next routine, the next ambition. And that will put them back onto their path of motivation and pull them into the next level of performance. It, if you're stuck in that, that sort of comfortable life, which is not a bad place to be, it's quote, stuck. a lot stuck. better than caged. Hell yeah. Uh, but if you're there and you want to go to the next level, it, it requires discomfort because to drive the body to change, to drive the mind to change, uh, you're going to have to take risks and you're going to have to do things that push your limits because your body and your mind won't adapt unless they're stressed a little bit. And so, at least in my understanding um, of, of your work there, to lead that charged life, you, you do take that step, but you're taking a step into a place you don't know. You know you're adding another plate to the machine. Yes. You're, you're finding another challenge. Yes. And, and this is one reason that I think some of, of my you know, CEO type of clients, and I, I don't do that much coaching because I'm super busy with Bulletproof right now <laughs> at, as, as a you're company, it. it's awesome. but um, I still make time for that because it, it helps me to be, to be better at what I do to work with other high performers. And so many of these guys are like, I'm, I'm gonna be a, a, a CrossFit athlete, I'm, I'm gonna be a, an Ironman. And what's going on is they're finding a way to push themselves, yeah. whether it's physically, mentally, emotionally, whether it's from a philanthropy perspective, you know, setting giant goals. Uh, what it is, is it's this innate desire to not be caged, not even be comfortable, but to, to experience that charge that comes from having a goal, from stressing the biology, and then meeting that stress. And, and the risk that, that certainly I've done this as, as an entrepreneur, where like, okay, you can turn the stress up so you're, you're charged all the time, but you're not recharged. Right. How do you avoid being so charged that you deplete? Yeah, um, I've got awesome habits and routines. Okay, so you build life. processes for that. Yeah, yeah I, have to, I have to, and I have to be intentional about them, otherwise it won't happen. Like, I sleep eight hours. It's just, mm -hmm. I mean, out of 365 days of the year, I'm probably 300 plus eight hours. I force myself, even though, because my mind is often active, so I have to learn to calm my mind and calm my body and play, put myself in that space where it's possible for me to do that. I take care of my nutrition like crazy, okay. because I think you know your, your fuel tank has to be just optimized, so I'm crazy about my nutrition. But I also do mental breaks throughout the day. So the most important, High Performance Academy, we teach the importance of 75 minutes to 90 minute breaks. Significant ones. Yeah, that's a big one. You just don't work beyond that. You just go up to that 90 minute mark if you have a lot of mental endurance. A lot of people don't. So it's like, actually take 60 to 75 minutes. All I want you to do, get up, 
go to this go to the sink or the filtered water get some water drink the whole glass of water fill it up again come back bring it back do just two three minutes of stretching or qigong or cupping or yogic type of work whatever you need to do and then go back down and then i meditate twice a day and i do a combination uh, almost always 20 minutes. Okay, 20 uh, minutes twice a day. Yeah, 20 okay. minutes almost twice a day. Um, I don't always hit, probably 70% of the time I hit twice a day. And there's a YouTube video, I, uh, half a million people I've taught to meditate <laughs> on YouTube. It's called the release meditation technique. It's, it's how I, it's basically mantra based uh, meditation where I close my eyes and I repeat the word release. And my intention going into it is to release uh, physical tension and mental tension. And so releasing things, so just repeating the word release over and over. And if other thoughts or ideas come up, I just come right back to that mantra of release and go, and go with that, sitting still. Sometimes I play a sound or a music in the background, but usually not. Uh, and I think those combination of sleep as the foundation, that combination of great nutrition and meditation, and then I've worked out every other day for almost 19 years. And it's very guilt-free for me because I don't feel like I have to do it, it just every other day I do it. And sometimes it could be as simple as, I, just if I'm doing my events and I'm wiped, it'll be a 45 minute walk. Yep. Other times I like a more intense cardio because mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of our real longer term um, endurance come from lung capacity. How easy for my lungs to take in deep oxygenation comes from more cardio work, so I really like that. And, I'm, and, I'm and gonna I, send you a present. Uh, th there's a, a thing I use, it, it's a weight lifting thing for your lungs. It actually grows the lung capacity and oh, the muscles. Oh, yeah, give me that. No, I love you're that. gonna love it. Sorry, I'll send I it to you. I geek out on that yeah, stuff. Yeah, you know I, I do. <laughs> I, I, we both do. But if, if you're really, I didn't realize you were so into like the lung capacity thing. Yes. It, it's a cool hack because it's like builds muscles. Oh, it's so yeah. huge. Like you, your interstitials grow because oh, of your lungs have to like push air out. It's it's, it's like wow, I love it. Yeah, because right. I think breath is our our breath is creating our emotional reality, and that's not a, a philosophical guess. We can prove it by science, right? The, the, your oxygenation, how much breath you're taking in, can, uh, as, as everyone knows, you can hold your breath right now, your body will freak out, yep. right? But you can also super oxygenate it and your body will freak out. Then there's mm -hmm. a balance for you that you need to know about your performance. And so that every time you get up, what I tell people often do is just close your eyes, bounce in place, take 10 deep breaths. Mm -hmm. So you got up that, that you know 75 minutes, 90 minutes, you get up, go get that water, come back, maybe stretch, and then just close your eyes, bounce in place, take 10 deep breaths, repeat your three words about who you want to be and why, sit down, go back to work. Everyone can do that because it only takes, you know, it's a very quick break, it'd be a two minute break. Mm -hmm. But doing that gives me the mental edge to be refreshed constantly throughout the day. The, been the two big meditations completely release me from stuff and then I find myself clean and recharged. That is an awesome answer. And and this is the kind of stuff that I want you guys to get on Bulletproof Radio, actionable stuff. So th that's like a, a pretty nice recipe for a day. That, that's amazing. Thank you, I appreciate and, it. Well, just thanks for sharing it. And I, there are so many executives that certainly you've interacted with, with more of them than I have, um, but they don't have a routine like that. It's often, you know, I'll wake up and I'll go for a run every morning. And, and you're doing it every other day, which, which I think also shows some wisdom because stimulus recovery. Yes. Stimulus recovery, yeah. and when you're charged, it's so easy. Stimulus, 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 yeah. stimulus, and and you're talking about sleep, and you're talking about you know taking a break, doing things every other day. So and you know, what blows my executives' yeah. minds too. Is I take the same philosophy in my relationship with my marriage, and I think everybody should give this a shot. So you take a 20 minute break. No, from your <laughs> that's so good. <laughs> Uh, the recovery thing is so important, and I, I really mean it. So, so what we do, my, my wife is also an entrepreneur, as, mm -hmm. as I am. I own my own company, um, I own mul mul multiple companies now, but uh, we, what we do at the beginning of the year, we just schedule out every 90 days, just like every 90 minutes I have something, mm -hmm. every 90 days her and I disappear. And we go out, we go four to 10 days, and we just get away, the two of us. And we might go to a resort, we might you know, go to one of our vacation homes, we might even do a staycation, just depending on what we're doing, but it's just the two of us and we're off the grid. Nice. We're not working. I mean, if anything, if we have to, emergency, we might check in on something and we get an hour a day. That's all we get if we have to do that. But it's just us and it's just reconnecting. That's a recharge of a relationship. I think we need to recharge our physical body from 
giving a, its ability to recover from exercise and intensity. But I also think we need to do that from our diet. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm a fan of people doing cleanses or, or paying attention to uh, giving the body time to you know, deal with its digestive process. Mm -hmm. And I think we should do it in our relationships too. Give that time to rejuvenate with each other. And if people say, well, some, I can't afford to go to some fancy resort, but I'm like, you can afford two days to be together where it's just the two of you. Get the sitter, prioritize each other, sit down, talk, connect, because that's the easiest one to let it go off the rails because you didn't plan the rejuvenation. Yep. Well said. We're coming up on the end of the show, and I feel like I could talk to you for like 10 more hours. This and, is and awesome. The audience would, <laughs> would, would, you know, people driving in their cars are like, you know, I, I want to learn more about this. So I'm sure we'll get another chance at maybe at one of your events or something. I'll, I'll corner you and ask you a few more questions on video. But uh, in the meantime, the Motivation Manifesto, it's still in the New York Times bestselling list. And by the way, if you're watching this or listening, for authors like us, we pay attention. Like when you go out and you, you pick up a book, you order online, you go to the bookstore, it, we know. Like every, every week we see those numbers and, and like it, it matters because when you're on the list like, like you are right now, people see your book and your book will help people. I, I, I've read it, I, I absolutely know what, it, what it, it does and what it can do. So every time you, you buy it, like now, <laughs> it increases the odds of someone else buying it because it stays on the, on the list. So mm -hmm. if you're thinking about buying Brendan's book, which I recommend absolutely you do, it's on my shelf. Of course, my copy's signed, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, um, do it now, and that would be awesome. So the Motivation Manifesto, pick it up online, pick it up in your bookstore, it, it's really worth doing. Check out Brendan's High Performance Academy. This is uh, really, really the kind of thing, if you listen to this every day, it might be up your alley, and uh, I'll be there next year for sure. Yeah, I want you to speak. So I think we've talked about that too, because I just I love what you do, man. Thank, I mean, this thank is you, really, likewise. I mean, actionable stuff that you give, that's what people need. Yeah, it, it, it's helping a lot of people, and likewise, your work. So th you. thanks for letting us record in your fantastic studio with Portland behind us, the source of all good food. And uh, <laughs> I look forward to next time we, we hang out. Thanks, man. How do you lift weights for your lungs? Running on a treadmill isn't gonna do it. High intensity interval training, like sprinting until you wanna fall over, it does it a little bit, but it really doesn't change the resistance, the amount of pressure your lungs have to work. You wanna get strong muscles in your lungs? There's a biohack for that. It's called the power lung, and it's something that we carry on the Bulletproof store. I re-engineered the coffee process to create the Bulletproof process that makes beans without the toxins that rob performance from you every single time you drink most coffee.